BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello, how is it going? I am Gemma Bradley and welcome to Real Talk. Real Talk is a podcast for women by women. We're constantly being told how to be, look and think and it can all get kind of overwhelming. We've taken six key issues that keep popping up on our news feeds every day. And along with a panel of journalists, influencers and policy changers, we're going to try and break that down together. We want to start an open conversation. If you agree, that is great. If you don't, that's okay too. In this episode, we explore mental health and how to cope when you're feeling anxious, stressed or depressed. I'm joined by Radio 1 presenter and trainee counsellor Katie Thistleton. 18-year-old Clara Oliveira, who opens up about her experience with anxiety and depression. And Megan Galise gets real with us about what it's like to live with OCD. Let's get real. Guys, let's just start this off. Kitty, what does mental health mean to you? Oh, wow. Straight in. I love it. (laughs) Straight in with the big questions. What does mental health mean to me? Do you know what? I think we have said mental health so much over the past few years, which is brilliant. It's become something that almost people shy away from now. People are like, oh, I'm sick of hearing about it. Or, oh, everyone's always banging on about it. And I think because of that, it's kind of lost its meaning, as words do when we just use them every day in our vocabulary. And when we break that down, it's literally the health of our minds. And that's something that never goes away. That's something that's constant. It's with us from birth. It's with us till death. It's something that needs constantly looking at and thinking about. Um, But for some reason, we still don't think that way about the the phrase mental health, but we do physical health. You know, I think we're, we're in a place where we're very eat your five fruit and veg, don't drink too much alcohol, you know, do your exercise for your physical health. But it's almost as if we think mental health is some new woke concept that (laughs) we've come up with over the past few years, but we haven't. It's always existed. It's just that that there does seem to be a lot more talk about it now in the media, which is absolutely brilliant. So to me, it is the health of your mind. And a lot of the time I like to use the phrase emotional well-being for that reason, that I think sometimes that mental health people think is a diagnosis Mm -hmm. that's like the really serious mental health problems whereas emotional well-being people might attribute more to that day-to-day looking after your mind and looking after yourself which is kind of where we want to go with it even I guess looking at the sense like you nearly can't see mental health sometimes and that's maybe why why it does kind of come to play and people do shy away from it a bit Megan what what does mental health mean to you for me mental health is just as important if not more important than physical health and I think that there needs to be parity there. I think that it's come a long way in the past 10 years and people do feel more comfortable talking about their mental health now but I still think there's a lot of work to be done there. Like if you had a broken leg you would go to the hospital. If you have um, a sore throat you'll go to the doctor. I think that there needs to be more awareness there so that when people do feel like they're not well mentally that they can go to their GP and talk to them. I suppose it is finding that right place for you as well. Clara, I know you've just turned 18, you know, and growing up, it's tough enough, you know, just trying to figure out who you are and you've had your own struggles with mental health. So what what does that mean to you? People think it's a big, scary diagnosis and it's not. It's something that everyone experiences at some point. You know, everyone feels stress and everyone feels anxious. But what people feel to understand is that it's when that starts to consume your life a little more than it should and it starts to dominate the type of person that you are and you become that term anxiety or you become that term depression I think that's what people really feel to see and Katie you mentioned it too you said people start to shy away from the term you know I have people they're like oh that's a new thing everything's down to mental health oh it's just it doesn't matter it's just fine you'd be fine if you go for a walk but it's not like that it's something that really needs to be looked into and really needs to be focused on. Have we devalued what good mental health is and maybe normalized bad mental health? That's a really good question I think we we try and uh, and value mental health emotional well-being and a lot of our lifestyle a lot of our lifestyle goes against it 
doesn't it? Sometimes I think, you know, we do things so artificially, we'll sort of sit on our phones and do a meditation app and as great as those things can be, <laughs> when you actually look at that, it's like an episode of Black Mirror, isn't it? You're like, what are we doing? What are we doing <laughs> meditating, looking at our phones? You know, we sort of, it's kind of like running on a treadmill. You know, I feel like if our ancestors looked at that, I ran on a treadmill today, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But I think if our ancestors looked at that, they'd think, what are you doing? Look at the great outdoors. You could just go outside and run. And I think sometimes, you know, we've, we've adapted to have this really online life. And and it's sort of like a tug of war, like one side of it's like, oh, this is good for your mental health. And the other side's like, oh, but this is really bad. I think sometimes we can devalue it. We can think that we're doing really good things and we're, we're making these big steps. But actually, are we taking like one step forward, two steps back? I yeah. completely agree. It's turned into such a commercial thing as well. Um, I know there's people in my school now that come in with these like different scented things and goes, this is for mindfulness and this is so you feel less stressed that is all marketing it's just to sell it's just for money you know it's became mental health became such a thing where people are using it to their advantage you know big marketers they're using that to get so much money because there are people that buy that stuff that say yes this is going to help me smelling this three times a day is going to mean that I will not be stressed throughout the day yes you will be (laughs) you know (laughs) that reason to be you will be stressed yeah I think that's really dangerous as well because it puts people off actually seeking help and um, yep. if they think that it's not a big deal and it's something that can be solved with like a meditation app like I've had instances where I went to trained counsellors for my OCD and they've told me or asked me like have you tried having a bath have you tried some um, proper self-care like doing a face mask or having a bath in Northern Ireland especially you know mental health services here are so underfunded It's so difficult for people here to actually receive help. It's like when someone tells you to exercise, isn't it? And I'm like, well, yeah, well, you know, I'll hold up my hands and say they're right about exercise. You know, (laughs) it does it does help and it does work. And it is something that really works to help me with my mental health day to day. But when I was depressed, nothing could have got me up and out of bed into the gym. I mean, I did used to try and force myself to go to the gym. I used to try and force myself to go to tennis lessons. I didn't, couldn't care less about tennis. But ju- during that crisis I was having of thinking I needed to do something else with my life, I, you know, I was trying to be a gym person, trying to be a tennis person. And I, 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 remember, I literally remember sitting outside tennis lessons, like outside the court, like crying in my car, like this is taking all my strength. I can't, I can't do it. And, and even so that when I got better, I had to change gym. And we were moving anyway. I went to that gym and I got this feeling of, oh, I remember being on this same treadmill and in this same room and feeling sick with like anxiety. And I associated it with that place. So I think I think you're totally right with what you're saying there, Megan. Yeah, like there's days whenever I don't have the energy to brush my teeth. So <laughs> going for a run is just completely out of the question. Exercising isn't isn't going to help me whenever I'm in that state of mind. The exercise definitely, definitely does help whenever you're in the trenches with it and your mental health is really bad like there's nothing that can you're not going to go out for a run you're not going to go to the gym you do feel so much better see if you're able to get up and get a shower and get dressed even if you're going to sit in the house for the rest of the day but the actual fact that you are dressed you feel so much more prepared for the day like if anything yeah. comes up, you're like it's fine I'm dressed you know what I mean it's, it's okay yeah. <laughs> it's so true lockdown that was like I reached a point where I was like get up and brush your damn teeth <laughs> and you'll feel and you'll feel better because there was too much moping around and it, and it wasn't making me better over lockdown here like over Christmas that was miserable you could go nowhere you could do nothing you were just caged in and that did not motivate you because you couldn't go anywhere so mm-hmm. there's no point of getting dressed so you were just sitting there you're like oh I'll just do my pyjamas. But then that gets you into such an awful mentality too. You feel so lazy almost. You just sit and mope about and you feel so bad for yourself. But then you're like, this is self-inflicted. So then you feel worse. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Such a hard time for people anyway, isn't it? It's, It's a hard time at the best of times, that sort of December, January period for sure. But Megan, I know that, you know, you live with OCD. So that must have been hard for yourself as well, just being inside. When did you kind of know or find out that you had OCD and how does that kind of affect you day to day? Yeah, well, I've struggled with OCD for really my entire life, like since I was a child. 
Um, and yeah, I used to not really talk about it. I, I was honestly embarrassed by it because there are so many misconceptions about OCD. People don't seem to fully understand it even now. Started out um, when I was a child um, and my obsessions were mostly around like health, like really bad health anxiety um, illness and worrying about losing loved ones like death um, so yeah for me it was I would have an intrusive thought um, about something terrible happening or something bad happening to someone I care about and then to like neutralize that thought or alleviate it I would carry out compulsions and um, so these can be things like touching a surface a certain amount of times or um, yeah counting uh, asking for reassurance repeatedly and um, just, just and <laughs> it, I know it sounds irrational but for someone with OCD it feels like that alleviates the bad thought mm -hmm. and um, yeah it makes you feel safer but before the pandemic I was in recovery really um, after years of therapy and then the pandemic hit and obviously it was a pandemic it was an illness that was going around so it was really my worst nightmare um, so yeah, like last year, um, my OCD did get really out of control. It didn't leave the house for, I think, three or four months. Didn't leave my front door. Um, was washing my hands with bleach. Um, just repeating compulsions all day, every day. Um, it was awful. So if you'd asked me a year ago if I thought I was going to be here today, I would have said no, genuinely. Um, but yeah, got through it. Oh my God, Megan, you've had such a hard time last year yeah um but yeah I would say that for anyone that does have OCD or is suffering with it like if I got through it honestly you can too because um there there is a way out whenever you're in the trenches with it and it's really bad you feel like you're never going to get out of it but you can get through it it was one of my first thoughts when this all happened like you know what that, that will be like for people with all different mental health problems but OCD in particular like you say, it's everything you worry about all of a sudden everywhere on the news and everything, isn't it? You know, I think it it would have made people who never worry, worry. How, how did you, like, what did you do to deal with it, Megan? Yeah, so family and my partner sort of intervened and were like, this is completely out of control. You need to get this under control. So contacted my GP. I've been on antidepressants before, but went back on a higher dose of the antidepressants that I'd been taking previously and then started therapy again and the kind of therapy that I do for my OCD is ERP so it's exposure re response prevention therapy where you basically have to sit with your intrusive thought or do the thing that makes you anxious which is really hard during COVID because a lot of those therapies will mean not washing your hands or yeah, um, not sanitizing everything that comes into your house. So that's a whole other minefield in itself. But yeah, doing a lot better now. <laughs> I guess, you know, what does it make you feel like when you hear people with like, you know, small phrases saying, oh, everyone gets anxious. Everyone has bad days. I'm just a little bit OCD. Like how, how does that affect you? For OCD, there are so many misconceptions around it. And around like obsessive compulsive like spectrum disorders as well and I think that's why a lot of the time people go for years without diagnosis because it's so misunderstood like I didn't know that I had OCD until I was in my early 20s because of shows like obsessive compulsive cleaners because that's not what OCD is um, and I've had so many instances where I have mentioned to people that I know that I have OCD and they've said like well we're all about OCD or yeah I have OCD too I'm always cleaning and it is honestly infuriating um yeah because it just perpetuates that stigma and it just makes it harder for people to seek help with mental health problems they so link into each other there's so many you know parallels with OCD depression anxiety eating disorders like you know, you can kind of almost have a pick and mix bunch of, of symptoms, I think, can't you? And, and I think like we see these things depicted in the media, like you say, I think I was thinking that about eating disorders when you were talking as well, because I think a lot of people go undiagnosed with eating disorders because they think it looks a certain way on a TV show or what you kind of see in the media or like you say, what people say, and that's not the case. So people can go undiagnosed and 
I think we do need to educate people a bit better about those phrases, don't we? There's so many now that, you know, because I'm kind of well versed in this world, I'm very careful not to say. I would never say, oh, I'm, I'm being OCD. That's setting off my OCD. And I would have said that in the past because everyone did say it. And it would have been like someone had odd socks on and you'd go, oh, you're setting off my OCD, you know, and I would never say anything like that now that I'm more educated on it. It's the same as phrases like committed suicide that obviously derives from a time when it was illegal. And now, you know, it's instead we say died by suicide. So there's a lot of those phrases that people drop in still all the time. I mean, people that you think would know better, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this stuff just gets into our vocabulary, doesn't it? Like my mum, for example, she's um she's had depression, and you think that I because I was so confused when she got diagnosed. I was like, "What do you mean? Like you're not upset? Like you've got me, you've got my brother, you're married, you live in a house. What is there to be sad about?" But it wasn't anything to do with her life now. It's something to do with her life before when she was a child, and that is something that's never talked about. Like when you think of depression, no one ever mentions childhood trauma, and if they do, then it'll be as a joke. They'll be like, oh my God, look at me, I have childhood trauma. It, you see it all over TikTok. It's everywhere. It's like, ha, 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 ha. But it's not funny. Like, that's one of the big reasons why people have undiagnosed depression because they have past trauma that no one mentions. It's so bad. I think it's interesting how you said, like, Megan, that, you know, you, you were still working and people managed to function, you know, with with the worst mental health, with 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 you know addictions and, and all kinds of things and perhaps again maybe go undiagnosed or think or other people around them think that they're not doing so bad but actually I think what works one of the last things we give up because we, we see that as such a failure and if you're somebody who struggles with that anyway the broken arm analogy always gets used but it, it was so striking to me because when I was a kids tv presenter I had depression at that time and I would I broke my arm. <laughs> I broke my arm ice skating one night and I was back in work the next day and everyone was like, oh God, you look really pale. Like you shouldn't be in. Why have you not had a day off? And I was like, I'm fine. It's on my arm. Like as long as I just needed the makeup artist to literally brush my hair for me. But other than that, you know, it's fine. But when I was depressed, I wouldn't have dreamt of having a day off. I dragged myself in and I sat in the toilets and cried just to have a moment where I didn't have to speak with anyone and make any small talk because I didn't have the emotional energy for it and then after I got better I, I was like wow that comparison literally happened in a matter of months for me and it was just so so striking and I think yeah like you say Clara you know people people carry on with with these mental illnesses and people might think oh it's not so bad because they're not fitting that description of the person on tv who's like the picture of depression everyone always says whenever there's like a stock image used it's somewhere like this well, no, they might be going to work. They might be going to tennis lessons like I am, but they're depressed. <laughs> you know, what do humans do best? They put on a mask, a facade to, you know, let everybody know that they're all right, even though that may not be the case. Now, Clara, I know, like I say, came back to it. You've only just turned 18 and, you know, you said you're learning um, about like different different things in school and things like that. And when, you know, it's tough enough kind of growing up, finding yourself, but what was it like for you when you kind of realized you had anxiety? What, how, how did you find that out or what kind of, you know, triggered that? Um, well, I've always been a very anxious child. That's just me since I was very, very young. Before I lived here, I lived over in Portugal until I was six and it was only me and my mum. And so... I didn't always have a very close relationship with her because she worked like shifts around the clock. So I was child mind do this, child mind do that. And I was always kind of on my own, which I think was probably the start of it because I didn't see my mum very often. It was constant worry of when is she coming back? Is she coming back? And I think that's what kind of triggered me from the start. But, you know, we moved here and I've lived here ever since. But we just, I got on with it. I just thought that, oh, I was just a bit worried and that was fine. And it went on and I hit about 14 and anything, I, I mean, the most minute thing would stress me and I wouldn't eat. Or if I did eat, I would eat everything around me. Like I would raid the cupboards dry. They would be gone. It was one or the other. So I would either lose weight or gain weight excessively. And that continued on. And mum was like, mm, are you okay? So I got referred, it took two years for me to get there. And Megan, like you said, have you tried going on a walk? Have you tried taking a bath? 
mm, I say, do you feel suicidal? No. Okay, then. I was like, that doesn't mean that I don't need help, you know. Um, so that was a big thing. But with my anxiety, I think it's just, it is just the constant feeling of being sick. I think that's my main, my main, main problem with anxiety. It is intrusive thoughts and then feeling ill because of them. And you try your best to stop thinking about them. But the more you're like, no, 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 the more it's like, this is the thought that is in your head right now. And you know how in the friend group, there's always that one like person, you know, the big like, hey, everybody, that's me. I am that person. So every time I walked into school, I'd be happy and I'd be smiley. And as soon as I got in the car to go home, I was like, I'm done with this. I am so done. I can't be bothered going back. A big thing also that triggers it is body image. I suffered a lot because of the binge eating and starving, the binge eating and starving. I suffered a lot with body image. I still do. I still feel really, really uncomfortable in my body um, a lot of the time. So that's also a big trigger and the slightest thing will trigger you and it'll send you into a big hole of just don't talk to me do you know what I mean when you're getting to that point where it is consuming your life it's it's really really tough and it can be crippling at some point you know um especially like you say if you are that that happy friend that you know keeps everyone's spirits up in the group I'm sure that probably felt quite draining for you having to you know do that constantly constantly wearing a mask constantly pretending to be someone that not how you are right now like fair enough yes okay I am a happy person in the sense of like I'm lucky that I have a roof over my head and I have food on the table and that I am happy that way but there are some days that it's just you don't want to be there and then there's also the whole stigma behind it you know people advocate and say mental health I mean you should talk about it but then if you turned around and people found out in school that you're going to see the school counselor the absolute digs that you would get or the mm-hmm. stares that you would get or people just be like oh she's not okay you know the people that go on be like yes positivity and then are the same people that would slag you for going to the school counsellor and I went I went to one session with the school counsellor and I automatically regretted my decision and said never to go back simply because I was afraid of what I get said to so then when I did comms I did it over summer so I wasn't in school so I wasn't taken out of school early or coming to school late that's such a shame, Clara. That makes me so sad. I kind of, you know, when I was in school, I think, um, yeah, I wouldn't have known of anyone seeing a counsellor apart from a friend of mine, actually. And it would have been the person who everyone sort of knew had a hard life, had a, had a tough life, had had a hard upbringing. So it sort of would have been that you were seen as like the weird kid that had it bad, had a hard life. And then really like, oh my God, we all needed therapy because <laughs> everybody does. Like if it was just a culture where it was like everybody sees a counsellor, we'd be in such better nick and then like that stigma, like you say, would, would just be gone because that should not be the case. Like there won't be a single person at your school who wouldn't benefit from some sort of therapy, but we feel like, yeah, you're going to be seen as the weird kid that's got some strange problems. And that's so sad. I want to I wanna think that that's getting better. Yeah, I hate that even now for people your age, like I think I naively assumed that it was getting better for people who are yeah, younger. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's really disappointing to hear that there's still that stigma there and uh, around going to counselling. Also, it's interesting, Clara, I think you saying about you being like the life and soul of the party kind of person, because that's me too. I think sometimes maybe that's, I, I've kind of learned through therapy that that's part of the problem. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not someone who will be moody in a situation. I can't allow myself to be just not even moody, just like normal. Like I'm sure like it would just be fine to not be like jazz hands. Um, but but that's part of the problem because you put so much pressure on yourself in those social situations and at school and at work. And then when you come away from it, you're just drained, aren't you? I mean, I get days I'm like, I can't answer the phone to people. And it's like, it's either a colleague ringing me or it's a friend. And I'm like, I just can't. I've not got the... And it's a joke, isn't it? That's a big TikTok thing that like millennials and Gen Z is like, we can't answer the phone. <laughs> we don't want to talk on the phone. Like, text us. What are you doing? But I'm like that and it's because I've kind of exert, I have to be ready for that to give up that energy that I know I'm going to exert because I feel like I've got to be really friendly and really funny and all this. Yeah, and then it's when you come in and sometimes you don't give off the same amount of energy and people will be like, what's wrong? Are you okay? 
Oh, uh, once at CBBC, one of our producers came in the makeup room. I was having my makeup done. He was like, morning, am I like having my eyeliner done? So I was like, morning, you all right? And he was like, are you unwell? <laughs> no, I'm fine. I'm just like, it's like half six. I'm having my eyeliner done. But those messages then, I guess, say to you in your head over time, like, you've got to be like that. And at the time I was a kids TV presenter. So you definitely do have to be like that for your job. And even like off air, I didn't feel like I could be just a bit depressed if I wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that I think that that's, for me anyway, like one of the only good things to come out of this pandemic is that for people, well, for me anyway, living with OCD, it's made work more accessible. So like if my OCD was really bad and the, it would take me forever to get into work in the morning, repeating rituals before I left the house, then having to be on the whole day talking to people, hiding the fact that you're doing these mental compulsions in your head while you're trying to have conversations with people in person. Um, yeah, and like you said, Katie just completely drained by the end of the day. So for me, yeah, the only good thing to come out of this is I can work from home and in between meetings I can just go and lie down for 10 minutes and yeah recharge sometimes you need that recharge as well I've been there I've had a lie down on the bed between me and say well, you need it you really do talking about that kind of pressure you know we've touched on your depression a bit Kitty but you know you're you're so successful how did you push through that when you were going through that well do you know what it's nice of you to say that I'm successful thank you because I obviously don't feel like I am as somebody who uh, has mental health problems um but you know what <laughs> I was always such an ambitious person and my career was so the most important thing to me for years and years and years. Um, yeah, now I look back and I actually think that my ambition was coming from quite a negative place. It was coming from my low self-esteem and my insecurities and me, um, you know, I, I struggle with body image, always have massively as well, like you were saying, Clara, you know, it, it saddens me that I'm 32 nearly and it still does because I think, God, when does this end? <laughs> I don't want to be an 80-year-old woman worrying about what I look like. Um, but I think because I was a quite low self-esteem and and I've always just been worried about how I come across people liking me, people disliking me. The recurring theme of my nightmares is that everyone I know turns on me and dislikes me for some reason and hates me and I have it all the time and I've always been a people pleaser I'm worried about what everyone thinks so I think I just saw like get a really good job you know it'll make you feel good it'll fill that hole it'll fill that hole that's missing you know and so I think a lot that my sort of bad mental health almost fueled me to work hard and actually what's been more difficult is is reaching a point where I'm allowing myself to slow down and I have now um, and it's funny, I did an exercise recently in college because I'm retraining to be a counsellor and they asked us to write down all the traits about ourselves. And I realised that ambitious and hardworking weren't even on it um, and that would they would have been my defining features in my 20s. Um, and I felt quite good about it. Well, I actually know at first I felt guilty about it. I thought, oh my God, I'm not working hard enough. You know, obviously my internal <laughs> monologue did that. But then I thought, oh no, that's great. You've got to a place where you can kind of accept yourself and find the meaning and the happiness in everything in life, not just thinking you've got to work I think I was a workaholic and we've all got these different things this whether it's compulsions whether it's addictions you know whether it's eating I I'm I binge eat you know that's something I've struggled with for a long time and um, we've all got something that kind of quietens those voices <laughs> weirdly when I'm actually people say oh do you have panic attacks when you're working you know what do you, does your anxiety affect you when you're working it never does never when I'm on air or I'm about to go on stage does it even um bother me it's the quiet moments when I'm sat watching telly or lay in bed at night um, but I think what I struggle with and Gemma this is something that you'll um, empathize with I'm sure is our career is quite unstable you know you don't know where the next paycheck's coming from you don't know how long you'll be flavor of the month for you don't know when your contracts will be up and you know I have those kind of crisis talks all the time of you know will Radio 1 sack me and then I won't get any work and da -da 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 -da. like we all go through those kind of things all the time and I think Sometimes I think you chose the worst job in the world for someone who has anxiety and depression. Why did you go for this job? Um, but it's just about finding these ways of managing it. And I think, you know, I've had I've had a lot of counselling. I've I'm on antidepressants and I'm, I feel very strongly about, you know, if antidepressants are for you, then great. I don't think there should be a big stigma about them. They completely changed my life, you know, um, and I've had a great experience with them. So I, I just have to find these ways of, of managing it. But I think you have a power. I think when you've had depression, 
or you've had OCD or you've had something like this, you have a power in that you can spot then when it's creeping back in. Um, and I would not turn the clock and, and not have had that really bad spell because I've had it now and I know I can survive it and I know that life gets better from it, that you can be literally, you know, as you described earlier, Megan, and I knew Clara, you, know, you can literally feel like desperate, you know, that life isn't worth living and then you can come back to being the happiest you've ever been. And I think it's powerful having experienced that because you can you can keep that memory when if you hit those times again, you know. Your work like was what got you through in you were saying like how ambitious and hard working was like your main like, character traits that's just me oh <laughs> clara you just you're just me at 18 <laughs> that is my that is my stage in life right now um i completely get that like i don't have a talent oh this fun story time connected to this i swear but um me and my friends were like talking about talents and um some of my friends can sing my best friend Anna she is really really good at doing art like she can do anything that girl is amazing my friend Molly she's all into her music and she's really edgy and she can also do art and I'm sitting there and I was like I can't sing I can't dance I can't draw I can't do anything I cannot do anything and my friends turn around me and go no you can learn really really fast you're really, really good at school. I was like, that's not the character trait that I want to have because that just stresses me more because then you feel like you need to be up there all the time. Like you feel like you need to meet that mark every single time. I did a sociology test and she gave me, I think it was like 72 or something. And because she's so used to get giving me 80s and 90s, she pulled me aside. She wouldn't have pulled anyone else aside. Pulled me aside and goes, are you okay? I was like, <laughs> you don't need to stress me any more than I'm already stressed. <laughs> I don't think I need this right now. But um, you know, also saying like work got you through it. You know, you just kept powering through. And this is gonna sound so trivial compared to like you being so motivated to go to work. But movies help me a lot. I love movies. I love TV, and I love analyzing TV and going through and picking things out, finding Easter eggs, all that. I love that type of stuff. So that was a big thing that helped me through my whole teen childhood. Like since the start has just been any time I felt anything, I was like, I'll just stick on a movie and it's going to be okay. And you have your comfort movies. Like Marvel is not a movie, but the whole franchise is my comfort. (laughs) Compared to your work, it's very, very, very different. But it's just, it is something that helped me through it so much. No, honestly, I mean, first of all, I just want to say like, you have got talent. Like I used to think this as well, but what I have now that really helps me, I just have a list in my phone. And I got this from Matt Haig's book, Reasons to Stay Alive. And he has a list of things that make him better and things that make him worse. And I wrote mine, my list of things that make me better. And it's like sitting under a blanket, you know, watching um, comedies, watching dramas, like you say, something uh, something gripping where you get lost in it. Um, it's all these different, having a nap, you know, exercise, all these different things. Um, and I tell myself, you know, work's on that list too. Doing job, doing a job I enjoy is on that list too. But I always try and tell myself everything on that list is important as, as, the, as the other. So if I'm ever going to think, oh, I need to work, I need to be successful, da, da, da. No, I can have a couple of hours out and I can watch a film, like you say, because that is doing as much for me and enriching me as much as the other things. If that if that thing is a comfort to you and it helps you and it's a coping mechanism, it doesn't matter if if, if the, the society deems it as important. You know, all those things matter as much. And I think, yeah, your Marvel films are a, are a good one. Should we be learning more about kind of taking care of our mental health from a young age and, you know, learning that emotions are good and obviously having a good diet and exercise? Because I know from a young age, you know, if I wanted to cry or something like that, immediately I would just put that off and be like, oh, no. I can't let people see me cry. And it's still to this day that like, if I start to well up, I will sprint out of that room to make sure that nobody sees that. Um, So is it something that we should be, I guess, teaching from a young age? I think so. Yeah, I think that it's really important to teach children to be open with their emotions and to teach them about different uh, mental health disorders that they could have. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that yeah, whenever I was a child and a teenager growing up with OCD and the intrusive thoughts I was having, I thought I was the only person, I thought I was the worst person in the world, felt like a monster. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I realised, no, actually, I have OCD and lots of people have this, so I'm not alone. I do think that 
saying, oh, well, people should um, care about their like self-care and all of that it kind of puts the onus on the person. But I think um, in the UK and in Northern Ireland, like it does go back to a lack of funding in mental health services. And there's a severe lack of funding across the UK and Northern Ireland specifically. Um, so I think work needs to be done there. Yeah. Especially in boys. I think a lot of the time uh, girls are like sadly accepts it more if a girl shows an emotion. It's like, oh, it's okay. She's a girl. She can let her, you can let her cry. It's fine. And I think a lot of the time with boys, it's bottle it up. Be a lad. You're fine. Um, so, you know, raising more awareness for them is really, really important. You know, the type of mental health that men face as well. Like, you, it's not talked about as much. It, a mental health is talked about as an big umbrella term. And then, like, for example, here, there's five of us girls. Do you know what I mean? There's no boys. And there are people that deal with it as well. And there are people that struggle to come forward with it a lot more than girls do, you know. And then there's all this research like, oh, it's not females because they have this obligation or it's not girls because they think that they have this obligation. And men don't apparently have those obligations, even though men have the same obligations to to family and to work. It's not seen like that in this type of society, which is awful as well, but that's a whole different side of it. Um, I think male um mental health is a big thing that needs to be promoted as well and a lot more people need it advocated I think completely and it's just why everyone wins with equality like you know the biggest thing that stresses me out is if we do like international women's day on the show and men message and say and have take the off about it and I and I you know if you write write down every issue that you want to fix for women it will also fix an issue for men because these these stereotypes that we live in and these roles that we go into, you know, everybody wins with equality. And it's like you say, Clara, all those things that men are taught to believe when they grow up are just so incredibly damaging. What do we what do we do wrong with our men? But we do <laughs> like we do something wrong with the way that we bring up men and boys. And, and that's why there's such a mental health crisis there. And that's what that's what needs to change. We all have mental health. We all have our own pressures, our own struggles in society. We all have emotions. So, you know, um, everybody should be able to express that and get the help that they need if they are struggling. Um, If somebody does think, you know, that they are unwell, what should they do? What steps did you kind of take to help help you? Well, always, you know, GPs should be and mostly are brilliant in my experience definitely have been you know I had a great experience with a GP who I went to see when I was really depressed and I was crying and, and he was brilliant and I remember he said to me we will sort you out we'll fix this and it was just the most powerful thing um for him to say the way he put it in we the way he you know said it like you know we're gonna help you and he said it like it was just definite you will definitely get better you know we will we'll sort this out like he was gonna fix my car um, and and he was right, <laughs> but it was just so powerful the way he said that. So always going to your GP, um, and I am such a big advocate for counselling. And there are so many different types. You know, Megan, you mentioned a particular type that you have for your OCD, and obviously, I mean, it's awful to hear how long Clara waited for help, and that can often be the case. I found myself going private many times because I just couldn't wait, and not everybody has that option, which is sad. But also what's brilliant is so many amazing helplines and um, Samaritans. Oh, they're just incredible. And you don't have to be literally at the end of your tether to call them. You know, I think that's what people think, but you don't have to be. The shout as well. You can text them 85258. So on your keypad, you start at the top on the middle numbers and it's down and up. It's easy. So that's how it's easy to remember if you look at your keypad. And you can text them, which is brilliant because also we're not always in a situation where we can speak loudly on the phone. You know, if you're in a if you're in a household where you don't want somebody to hear what you're saying, they're a brilliant text service. Twenty four hours, just like Samaritans, anytime text them. Um, if if you're in a mental health emergency or you know you just need someone to talk to, um, it's always there. There's always help there. There's always somebody to listen. So oh, just please, always, always just speak to someone and reach out. And you'll think it's, it seems impossible that you'll ever get better, but I did. And so did so many others who say the same thing. You know, Megan, you thought last year 
that was the case for you. As well, I'm a really big advocate for medication and antidepressants. And if you're considering it, but are put off by stigma, I would say give it a go. Talk to your GP. There's no shame in taking antidepressants. They changed my life, honestly. Completely changed my life. And yeah, I would say they're for everyone. <laughs> so yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I know there's, there's people who, who've maybe not had such great experiences on them. There's, you know, sometimes you've got to try different ones, etc. Um, I have also had a great experience with them. And I just think there's a lot of people who would be here now if they'd taken antidepressants and there wasn't such a stigma and they didn't feel like that they couldn't do that and it was given up or a last resort or, you know, I... <sighs> I didn't want to do it, but I got to a place where I just, just, I absolutely had to, couldn't feel like that anymore. And yeah, one of the best things I ever did. So, and I still feel that stigma. I still feel like, oh, I need to come off them. And then I'm like, no, why are you feeling like that? You know, <laughs> you, you know, you spend all your life telling people there shouldn't be a stigma. Um, I think also family. So like me and mommy are really, really, really close. Like we're really, really good friends. And um, talking to them, especially if they sure your experiences like me and mum you know we're very very similar in the way that we have mental health and how you deal with it and stuff so um having that person to talk to and it'll, it'll start off as a very serious conversation but the end of the, the whole thing like you'll be laughing with each other and it'll be something that you realize you know whenever you need it you can just come and talk about it and it will end up okay you know it is sometimes you just need to talk to someone that's very close to you and the same way sometimes you need to talk to someone that doesn't know you like if you bring a helpline sometimes you just need someone that's not gonna like bring you back after and be like are you okay because you're not in that state of talking about it anymore and you can't just talk about it whenever so it is it is just finding what you prefer you know it's finding what makes you feel better because something that will work for me won't work for Megan or something that will work for Megan won't work for Katie um so it is you just need to figure out who you are as a person and what helps you. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, you never are alone. There are people out there that want to help. Um, and like you said, Clara, it is just about finding the right thing for you, whether it's family, the doctors, you know, support groups or counselling, you know, there are kind of services available out there to help. But guys, honestly, thank you so, so much. Um, this has been such an insightful conversation and I have loved chatting to you and finding out about your movie preferences, Laura, um, love that. So yeah, I, you agree. <laughs> <laughs> I could not agree. It's it's my favorite. So, um, but honestly, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you, ladies. It has been just yeah, amazing, amazing to chat to you all. Thank you. If you think that you may have been affected by any of the issues discussed in this episode, you can find more information and advice at bbc.co.uk slash actionline. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts.